A very good morning, a very warm uh, uh, good morning to all of you and welcome to this platform this morning. And I greet you in the wonderful name of our Lord Jesus Christ. And today I want to talk to you about a very important subject because many believers do not know the sovereignty of God and what it means. God has not asked anybody's permission to do something in our life. He is supreme and there's no one like him. Let me go into this topic and see what the word of God is saying about the sovereignty of God. Uh, uh, and uh, my God give us the wisdom to understand what God wants to, stand, to say to us in this most important topic. Uh, before I start, let us look what is the meaning of sovereign. Uh, in the dictionary.com give these uh, meanings. Uh, first is the monarch, a king, a queen, or other supreme ruler a person who has supreme power of authority and the Merriam-Webster dictionary, one possesses supreme power. And God is sovereign because he is supreme or above all. Now before, uh, what I want to do actually is to talk about what God cannot do. Can you believe that there is thing that God cannot do. So let us go into that, that uh, you can see there are things that God cannot do. So uh, God cannot be tempted by evil. James 1 verse 13, let no one say when he is tempted, I am tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does himself tempted uh, anyone. God can also not lie. It's impossible for God to lie. And that gives us actually so much of uh, peace inside us that when we read the word of God, we know that God cannot lie. What he is saying, it is the truth. In Hebrews 6 verse 18 said that by two immutable things in which is impossible possible for God to lie, might have strong consolation who have fled from refuge uh, uh, to lay hold of the hope set before us. Yes, we can doubt if people lie and if they talk the truth, but that you can know and it was sure that God cannot lie. Everything that is said, it's true. It is amen. There's not a lie in God. Another thing that God cannot do, he cannot change. In Malachi 3 verse 6, For I am the Lord, I do not change. Therefore you are not consumed, O sons of Jacob. So here we see that God cannot change. Uh, in his character, in his attributes, he stay the same. He cannot change, but in his operating, how we are doing things, that can change. We see it all over in the Bible, that that what is today a proceeding word, a true word for God, it, it, uh, it changed uh, to another proceeding uh, word. So we must know what is God's proceeding word in our time, in our generation, <clears throat> and that we not copy an old generation. And then we see God cannot deny himself. We must deny ourselves because we have a sinful nature, but God cannot deny himself because he is, he is the truth and he cannot lie. In 2 Timothy 2 verse 13, if we are faithless, he remains faithful. He cannot deny himself. So we know because of our sinful nature, yes, many times we find ourselves that we are faithless. 
but God remains faithful, even if we are not. So that is also a thing that gives us great peace inside ourselves when we call upon the Lord. He will not tell us a lie because he's faithful. And then another thing that God cannot do, he cannot stop to love people. He cannot stop loving. Why is that? Because God is love. Not a, a, a part of God that is love. No, he is love. His, his whole being is love. In Jeremiah 31 verse 3, the Lord has appeared for of all to, to me, saying, yes, I have loved you with an everlasting love. Therefore, with loving kindness, I have drawn you. That is how God drawn us to himself, by his loving kindness. And we, uh, we are not coming uh, because our motive is wrong if we want to come to the Lord because we are scared to go to hell. No, that's not the reason why we come to God. It's because his loving kindness draw us. He cannot stop loving. He loves us. doesn't matter what we do. But that is for those who, who, who accept Jesus as their Lord, Savior, and King. Uh, so uh, when we accept Jesus, we come in this environment of God that he loved us. He loved the unbelievers also. He loved the unbelievers also. God cannot break covenant. It's impossible for God to break a covenant. It says here in Psalm 89 verse 34, My covenant I will not break, nor alter the word that has gone out of my lips so that what God says it stands firm it will never change and God can also never change and he will never break a covenant so when we come into the kingdom of God we have a covenant with him and he will keep the covenant on so uh, the Bible also tells us that at the place there will be many covenant breakers at the end of time. So but God cannot break a covenant. And we must stay in this covenant because there's protection, there's peace, there's, um, yeah, uh, and we are safe there. Another thing that is impossible for God that he cannot do is that he cannot be pleased without faith. It says in Hebrews 11, 6, but, uh, um, but without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder for those who diligently seek him. So do you want a reward? Yeah, there is a reward when we are diligently seeking that we have faith in him. Uh, I found out in my own life that I was more on what I believe is in who I was believed. So it's not so much how much do you believe in whatever you believe, it's in who you believe. I must believe in God. And so uh, because uh, God is, uh, as we up to now, we see that he cannot lie and he'd be pleased when we have faith. And another word that I actually want to say is faith is to trust him, to trust him for if we ask him anything, we trust that he will give it to us when we ask according to his will. And his will is that um, we must make disciples. <laughs> that is his will. And his will is also that uh, we must grow uh, from where we are coming in the kingdom as the babies and that we will grow to maturity. That is his will. And faith is to trust God that he will bring us to that place. 
So you can know that God will do that. And then another thing that God cannot do, he cannot despise a broken heart and a contrite spirit. He cannot de 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 despise uh, someone with a broken heart and contrite spirit. So we need a broken heart that we can that he can form us in whatever vessel he wants us to be at a certain time. And so we also see that God is self-sufficient. He need nobody uh, because he's self-sufficient. In Genesis 17 verse 1, when Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appears to Abram and said to him, I am almighty God, walk before me and be blameless. So God would not say it to Abram as it was not possible because the more we, we uh, submit ourselves to his rulership, to his ways of doing, uh, and then we come to the place that we only desire to do what he wants us to do. But that's why Jesus died for us. When we, when we uh, sin or whatever we do, we can come to him, we can repent. He also gave us that awesome gift of repentance. And then we ask God forgiveness. He forgave us totally. He never thinks about that uh, again. And uh, then when we do this, it is actually it is actually an instruction when he said, walk before me and be blameless. Now that walk before him, it means actually it must be a lifestyle. Like to walk blameless before God is to have a lifestyle. To have the lifestyle um, of that. And so we see that he is El Shaddai all-sufficient one. His self-sufficiency is seen uh, in many areas. We can see it in the, he's the source of life. He's the source of life in John 5 verse 26. For as the Father has life in himself, so he has granted the Son to have life in himself. So God has life in himself. Therefore, he can give life. He does not possess life. He is life. He is love. He is the source of life. He is everything. And uh, then we see in Psalm 36 verse 9, for with you is a fountain of life. In your life we see light. Remember, Jesus was the light of the world, and we also need to be the light of the world. So that is why God created us to be the light of this world. Uh, the, uh, we must be the life of the world because we are in him. And when we are in him, we become like him. We become Christ-like. And in Romans 11, verse 35 to 36, it said, um, Or who has first given to him, and it shall be repaid to him, for of him and through him and to him are all things, to whom be glory forever. And we can only say amen on that. So through him, to him, and everything is in him, and we must grow up in all things in him and he as though he needed anything since he gives it to all life 
bread and all things. He lacks nothing. He does not need anyone or anything. He does not need food, clothing, shelter, company, entertainment, or help. He is complete by himself. He is not lonely. He does not need any support. He does not depend on anyone. He does not need praise and worship to sustain him. He does not need anyone to defend him. He creates out of, uh, of love and not need. God exists independently of anything. He does not need anything, including worship. So guess who needs everything? Me and you. We need everything from the Lord because we see he is self-sustained. He does not even need time because he is, he is internal. There is no time with him. There is no distance with him. We see in <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> excuse me, in John eight verse fifty eight, Jesus said to them, "Most assuredly I say to you, before Abram was, I am." So Jesus was there from the beginning. And God doesn't have a beginning. He doesn't have an end. He was there from, from eternity to eternity. And then we see in Exodus 3 verse 14. And God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, thus you shall say to the children of Israel, I am has sent me. To you. God is I am and not I was or I will be. He is not I want or desire. He is not I need. He is I am past, present and future. So we must seek him for today. We have enough for today. And when God said I am, he actually said I will be there for you in whatever need you have. God can reveal himself in anything. So he is, he, uh, he is the I am because he will need you as I am in where you are in your journey. <clears throat> he will not reveal himself to you uh, that in, in the place of somebody else. But they need, no, he will need you where you are. In Genesis 21, verse 33, then Abraham planted Tamarisk tree in Bathsheba, and they called on the name of the Lord, the everlasting God. What does this mean? It means he will exist for, for eternity to eternity. He's everlasting. He will, there will never be an end to God. And in Deuteronomy 33, verse 27, it says, The eternal God is your refuge, and underneath are the everlasting arms. He will thrust out the enemy from before you, and I and will say, Destroy. Here he said, He will thrust out the enemy from before you. Don't entertain your enemy because God is the one that trusts him and destroy him because God is eternal and is your refuge. You know that song that say that, that, that a righteous run into, into him and there's safety with him. He's eternal. He loves you and his everlasting arms is there. You must be able to experience his everlasting arms under you because he's there. He's self-sufficient is his self-existence. He is totally autonomous. And he does not need teaching or advice from anyone. <clears throat> In Isaiah 40, verse 13 to 14, who has directed the spirit of the Lord? Who has counsel? Has taught him? With whom did he take counsel? And who instruct him and taught him in the 
in the path of justice? Who taught him knowledge? Who showed him the way of understanding? No, he knows everything. He is all powerful and is all places at the same place, at the same time. So when you feel alone, you feel um, rejected, you feel there's nobody for you, guess what? He is there. He never leaves you. When you are his child, when you are his son, he's always there. So we must, this is the truth that God gave us in his word. And remember, we say he cannot lie. So you must believe the things because that is what he says in his word. And the next point is he does not owe anyone anything in job 41 verse 11 who has preceded me that i should pay him everything under heaven is mine so people are fighting about all kinds of things over land and all kinds of things but god said everything is mine when somebody takes something from you and you say, oh, you steal these things from me. No, they don't steal from you. They steal from God. Because you, with everything that is in your hand, he gave it to you. It belongs to him. You are the, the steward of the things that God placed in your hand. Everything. Nobody can take anything from you. Because if they do, it's not from you that they take it. It is from God. God, they take it from him. And again in Romans eleven thirty five to 36, or who has first given to him and it shall be repaid to him for of him and through him, of him, through him and to him are all things to whom be glory forever. And we say again, amen. It is the true, I mean, mean it. Uh, uh, it's, it, it shall be like that. And then we see the next thing. He does not need any one permission. He does whatever pleases him. In Psalm 115 verse 3. But our God is in heaven who does whatever he pleases. He do whatever. But, he, but coming our way, it is because he knows that we need that. Even if it's difficult time, it is for a purpose in our lives. Uh, because he knows the best for us. He knows what is going to happen tomorrow and the day after that. He knows how, where we are going. He knows everything. You can rest in the peace that God is totally in control. When things come against you, when there's enemy coming against you, know they are in God's hand. Know that they are in God's hand because where are you? You are with Christ in God. So that must bring us so great peace that whatever comes to us, God planned it for us for a reason. And we must find out what is the reason. What is God doing in my life? You know, <clears throat> sometimes there come things in our lives because when we are get through that, God gives us more authority. He gave us, he took us through difficult time that he can give to us authority because we will be tested if we he, he can give it in us not because he doesn't know it's because we do not know but if god is busy taking you through tough time he wants you to come to the place that he can give you more authority in um and he never gets a weary he does not need rest <laughs> We need rest because we have a body. It's the body that needs rest. But the spirit doesn't need rest. God never rests. He never slumber. He never sleep. It says in Isaiah 40 verse 28, Have you not known? 
Have you not heard the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, neither faints nor is weary. This understanding is unsearchable. Even if we put all the knowledge and the wisdom and understanding together, if we could do that, God, understanding is unsearchable. There's so much depth in that. We will never get to the end of that. Only after this life, when we are set free from the body, then we will do that. Psalm 121 verse 4. Behold, he who keeps Israel shall never slumber nor sleep. We part of, you remember the word that say, if we are in Christ, we are all the, 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 uh, the, the uh, from uh, uh, Abraham, we are his descendants. And so we are also then Israel. And that God never slumber nor sleep. Sometimes people say, oh, Lord, where are you? I'm now in this dry and thirsty place. No, no, no. He's still where he was all the time in your life. But maybe it's you that turn away. So come back to him. Say, say, you can say what the prodigal son said. He said, I will go to my father. Remember, he's our father. And I will say to him, so we must always, when we see that, oh, now something is going wrong, take that step back and say, Lord, I come back. Father, I come back. I repent. <clears throat> Please forgive me that I turn my back on you because he never slumber nor sleep. He never gets faint or weary uh, as if he, is, if he needs energy. When the Bible says that God rested, it means he stopped creating. This does not mean he was tired. And remember, he created everything according to a seed. And we know that a seed fell on the ground, died, and then they come up a new plant. So it's going on and on and on. And remember, God said, as long as we are on this planet, there will be seed time and harvest time. It will never end for us here until the end. When Jesus is coming back, then that will end. And then we see he is perfect. He is perfect. There's no defect in God. In Matthew 5, verse 48, Therefore you shall be perfect, just as your Father in heaven is perfect. Yes, we are busy working on our perfection. We come in in the perfection of Christ, but we are now busy working, uh, walking in that. Till we come to the place of ultimate perfection, when Jesus comes back, we will totally perfect just as he is. And because he is perfect, he needs nothing. He is without fault and perfect. He's complete in every way. He's perfect in holiness, in faithfulness, in righteousness, in wisdom love and truth. He is perfect. And then he takes ownership. He takes ownership. Heavens and the earth with everything in it belongs to the Lord. Everything belongs to the Lord. In Deuteronomy 10 verse 14, it said, Indeed, Heaven and the highest heaven belong to the Lord your God. Also the earth with all that is in it. <clears throat> so yes, that's why we can also pray that God will bring more people to the place that they can accept Jesus because everything belongs to him. And so we can pray that. In Psalm 89, verse 11, the heavens are yours. The earth also is yours. 
the world and all, all its fullness. You have founded them. Everything belongs to the Lord. And then we see in uh, Psalm 24, verse 1, the earth is the Lord and all its fullness, the world and those who dwell therein. Now God placed us on planet earth that we can represent him on the earth. He gave us that authority and he sent us actually out and said, you must do that. Jesus is not now here on earth. We must be like Jesus to other people. Those who do not read the Bible, those that do not know him. And you know what? When we are growing more and more into Christ, we will also cover those who are unbelievers. It will also benefit them. Psalm 50 verse 9 to 12. I will not took a booth from your house, nor goats out of your fold. For every beast on the forest is mine, and the cattle on a thousand hills. I know all the birds of the mountains, and the wild beasts of the field are mine. If I were, if, if I were hung, uh, hungry, I would not tell you, for the world is mine and all its fullness. Now, if God is so passionate about the wild animals, cattle, birds, all kinds of livestock, how much will for us that his son die? Don't you think he's more, more passionate about us because Jesus died for us? And guess God gave us the grace to accept that. What a great God that we serve. And everything under heaven belongs to God. In John 41 verse 11, who has preceded me that I should pay him? Everything under heaven is mine. You know, I think about, uh, they say uh, when Queen Elizabeth was still alive, she was the richest person on earth. But it was nothing that will belongs to her. Everything belongs to God. They can say this person and that person is that rich, number one, two, three, four, five. No, nothing belongs to them. God only gave it to them to be stewards of that because everything belongs to our God. And then all souls belong to God. In Ezekiel 18, verse 4, behold, all souls are mine. The souls of the Father, as well as the soul of the Son, is mine. The soul who sent shall die. So here he said, every soul belongs to God. But the soul that sinned shall die. If a soul sin without Christ, they will die forever. And death is actually separated from God. So that is why we are doing everything in our power that we can, that we can tell them the best thing for you is to become born again, to, to receive the offer that Jesus gave you, give you everything Everybody that was ever been born or is going to be born, receive this grace to be to come to Jesus Christ. It is, it is, uh, you don't need to pay anything for that. It is free. You cannot bribe anything in that. The only thing you can say is, Jesus, I accept the offer you, you give me and come into my life. Because I want to belong to this God. I want to belong to this God that we heard today from. And everything belongs to him, including vengeance. Romans 12 verse 19. Beloved, do not avenge yourself, but rather give place to wrath. For it is written, vengeance is mine. 
I will repay, says the Lord. So we don't need to do uh, bad things to other people that are doing bad things to us. Give them to God because his vengeance is mine. He will take care of that. We don't know how he's going to do that. But we can say, Lord, but we claim those people for your kingdom. We don't want them to, 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 to go into a wrong place. We want them also to know you as this awesome God, this sovereign God. And everything is his. Ne nothing belongs to anybody. It can maybe on paper for, for natural causes, but it still belongs to God. And Job understand this dimension of God's sovereignty. Therefore, when he suffered catastrophic loss, he responded as follows. Listen to that. Job 1 verse 20 to 21. Then Job rose, tore his robe and shaved his head and he fell to the ground and worshipped. You see, he did not cry. He was worshipping. And he said, naked I come from my mother's womb, and naked shall I return there. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. He still, I can remember when uh, also in, in Job uh, 3, I think, where God gave Sylvia of Job, and he said he never left his integrity. He stayed focused on God, even if he lost everything that he had, everything that there was nothing uh, uh, left. But still, he bowed down to the ground and he worshipped the Lord. And he said, blessed is the name of the Lord. So we can also... Uh, uh, work on that and said, Lord, when things like that happen to me, let I, that I also be, can say that. Blessed be the Lord. He is an awesome God. When we suffer loss, when we suffer many things, the word tells us that they already gave to us everything that we need to overcome that. Because God is looking for those that overcome. They will sit with him on his throne. Nehemiah 9, verse 6. You alone are the Lord. You have made heaven, the heavens of heavens, with all their host. Sorry for the my internet went off for a, for a moment. So let us go on. So um, that we see here that uh, God that does everything, that he is of all things. In Genesis 1 verse 1, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Isaiah 66 verse 2. For all these things, for all these things, my hand is my, and all those things exist, says the Lord. But on this one will I look on him who is poor and of a contrite spirit and who trembles at my word. Are we still tremble at the word of God? Are we tremble um, when we 
actually read about him and hear his majesty. Oh, we tremble. We really must ask God actually to give us the fear of the Lord because that will keep us safe. We see in Isaiah 45, verse 18, for that says the Lord who creates the heaven, who is God, who formed the earth and made it, who has established it, who did not create it. really satisfied Colossians 1 verse 16 for by him all things were created that are in heaven and on the earth visible and invisible whether thrones or dominion or principalities or powers all things were created through him and for him everything is for him for he created everything Psalm 100 verse 3, know that the Lord is God. It is he who has made us and not we ourselves. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Think about that. Meditate on him. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. We belong to him. Isn't that awesome and grateful? that we can know we belongs to him. He has ownership of us. Isaiah 42 verse 5, Thus said God the Lord, who created the heavens and stretches them out, who spread forth the earth and that which comes from it, who gives bread to the people on it, and spirit to those who walk on it. God created and you remember what was the most important thing for God when he created everything? He created everything for human beings. That was in his heart. That's why he created Adam and Eve the last. And then we see that God has a voluntary self-limitation. God limit himself for us. God is omnipotent, therefore he can voluntarily limit himself. He has the power to act, but chooses not to act. God knows the future, but might allow nature laws that he has created to proceed without interfering. God limits himself to a certain extent by giving man freedom of choice, freedom of free will. The relationship between God's sovereignty and free will is difficult to understand. Because we can realize and understand. For me, I understand I made a decision when I accept Jesus. Now I don't have any more uh, a, a choice. Because I want to have this choice. My choice is to do the will of God. You can go into uh, wikipedia.org and look there at the sovereignty of God in Christianity. It was accessed in five, in the 5th of March, 2021. You can read there uh, what it says about, about this. Uh, I'm not going to go into that. And then we see this voluntary self-limitation is, is seen in his delegation or authority and dominion to man. And Genesis 1 verse 26, then God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over the cattle over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. And even God knew that we are not 
always faithful. He chose to give us dominion. We must take responsibility of that, that we can use it not in an improper way. And then it's also seen in, in the incarnation in Philippians 6, verse, um, uh, sorry, Philippians 2, verse 6 to 11, who being in the form of God did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bond servant and coming in the likeness of men and being found in appearance as man. He humbled himself and become obedient to the point of death, even the death of cross. For, uh, through very, very difficult times for my sake and your sake. So that is what we can do. We can bring glory to him. And God limits himself. Sorry, it went there. Let me go on with that. He said, um, he will not think about our unrighteousness anymore. He, for, he make the choice to forget it. And in um, Hebrews 10, verse 16 to 17, this is the covenant that I will make with them after those days. Sorry, and um, let me go on. Uh, and he said, and I, he blots out our transgression for my own sake, and I will remember your sins no more. He limits his omnipotence, his all-powerful. Uh, to Peter 3 verse 9, the Lord is not slack concerning his promise as some count slackness, but is long suffered towards us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. So here we see he's not willing that any should perish, but we know that many will follow the path of destruction. Then we see he cannot lie. Titus 1 verse 2 I hope in eternity, uh, I hope in eternal life, which God who cannot lie promised before time be began. There will be time for us also of eternal life. When, uh, when we are in Christ, we will not perish. Hebrews 6 verse 18, uh, that by two immutable things, 
uh, in which it is impossible for God to lie, we might have strong consolation who have fled from refuge to lay hold of the hope set before us. There's always hope with God. God is truth. He cannot lie. Lie who deny his character of righteousness and holiness. And he cannot tolerate wickedness. So when there's wickedness, uh, remember he tolerate not wickedness. Habakkuk 1 verse 13. You of you are of poorer eyes than to behold evil. You cannot look on wickedness. Why do you look on those who deal treacherously and hold your tongue when he, the wicked devours a person most righteous than he? So we must remember when there's things like that coming against us, then we must remember, don't look at that because God cannot tolerate that. The, the outcry uh, of, um, or let me say, in his holiness and righteousness, he cannot look on evil. But because of his grace, mercy, and judgment, he does not reward us for our iniquities. Instead, he provides a solution, the atonement through the Son, through his Son. So um, for us, there is hope. Uh, but for those that are unrighteous, God cannot tolerate that. Now we see there was an outcry from Sodom and Gomorrah in Genesis uh, 18 to 20 to 21. And the Lord said, because the outcry against Sodom and Gomorrah is great, and therefore thy sin is very great, I will go down now and see whether they have done uh, altogether according to the outcry against it that has come to me and if not I will know God limits his omnis omniscient he knew of their sin but verse 21 presents the narrative that God had to first come down and investigate God gave a window period giving people the opportunity to come and repent this illustrates his justice he set an example of how humans should proceed. The matter must first be investigated before judgment is passed. In addition, God is a God of relationship and op operates out of relationship. He wants a relationship with all of us. So we must see that we can come to that place that we are in Christ in the in Christ position where we find safety, but it doesn't keep all kinds of things because God brings all kinds in our life so that we can grow up. So thank you for listening this morning. And the next time we will proceed with this topic and the, we, it will be at the same place at the same time. So God bless you. In Jesus' name, amen.